let's dig into Stop the World, I Want to Get Off, Part 4. Uh, it's okay to pause and mend our soul. This series, the reason we're doing this series is because there's been so many negative messages that have caused uh, anxiety uh, among us in the news, uh, political news, virus news, fake news, conspiracy theories, and just mask people. You know, like I tell you, it's just been really, really tough. And how do we approach this? So, um, uh, that's what this series is for, and I'll tell you what the series is about. But before I go on to the outline of the series, I want you to uh, go to my Facebook page or YouTube channel and watch the video interview I did last week called Finding Hope and Giving Hope in Times of Crisis. I think it will really speak to your soul. There's some depth there that may really surprise you and it will be timely. A number of people have written to me and said they have watched it twice or three times already. And I too have had to go back and listen to it again because of how how much our soul needs to hear the pause, the the redirection of our thinking to where it should be, not to where it's being dragged to. So anyway, go please go please and watch that. Please go and watch that. Oops, I said that backwards. Dyslexic moment. Um, then I came across this meme that I thought was very interesting. A perspective uh, uh, meme. Sometimes I just want to stop talk of covid pro protests looting brutality i lose my way i become convinced that this new normal is real life then i meet an 87 year old who talks of living through polio diphtheria vietnam protests and yet still enchanted with life he seemed surprised when i said that 2020 must be especially challenging for him no he said slowly looking at me straight in the eyes i learned long time ago not to see the world through the printed headlines i see the world through the people that surround me i see the world with the realization that we love big therefore i just choose to write my own headlines husband loves wife today or family drops everything to come to grandma's bedside he patted my hand old man makes new friend I hope you take that to heart. That was that was great. Okay, this series. So far, this is a recipe for our soul. Uh, so we first began with talking about being still and the importance of stillness, meditation, and what does it mean when Jesus went off to pray? What can we learn from that? Go back and watch that. It's a couple weeks ago. Then we talked about not being afraid. That took a whole message. I couldn't believe it. And then another whole message on rest which was, I think, something that we need to take uh, seriously. Um, and today I want to get into beloved. What does beloved mean? And then, of course, when beloved is done, which won't be today, uh, we're going to end with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of hope. And that one is going to be exciting because, uh, honestly, folks, like I've said in the past, for those that are spinning stories to you and I in, in, uh, in uh, saying that, hey, the end of the world's coming, look at the Bible, says this is all happening, it's all predicted, I'm going to ask you to take a chill pill, and I'm going to ask you to really rethink and re study again uh, a wider, broader perspective on uh, what end times can mean. Uh, what revelation can mean. Again, this isn't about me being more right than you or you being more right than me. This is about us exploring other perspectives that may offer a lot more hope than what we have been told. Because I believe there are some things that we have been taught and told that are completely incorrect. And yet we bought it hook, line, and sinker. I sure have. And so now as I question things more and more, the questions are leading to better answers. So please uh, be ready for the Nebuchadnezzar one. So beloved, let's, let's get into it. Beloved means be loved. Beloved means to be greatly loved. God is love. Jesus is the greatest expression of God's love for us. We are all, all, I should have made that in capitals. We are all his beloved children. Remember who you are. Beloved, repurposed, and cherished children of the one true God. That's what beloved is all about. Uh, usually we read verses, and I'm going to show them to you, that say, hey, beloved, you know, love one another, and blah, blah, blah. But we read over the word beloved so quickly, we just think it's a, a term of endearment. Hey, dear John or dear Ken, as you write a letter or an email. No, this is a very important word that if we pause and take a look at its meaning or how it's used in scripture, I think we're going to be blown away. I want you to hear God's love today, for sure. So what I want to discover in this beloved part 
First of all, what does the word beloved mean, which we just did? I want you to see God is love, which we'll get to next week. I want you to see that the theme of Scripture is not about history necessarily, but it is about love. Love is the theme. Agape, Jesus, is the theme of the entire scriptures. We bring Jesus to the scriptures. We don't go to the scriptures to find him. He's revealed there, and all of it points us to Jesus, which is what I think is really good good news. I also want you to see, by the time we're done, the beloved part, that God loves everyone unconditionally. Uh, That's a big deal in the Christian world because I have a hunch many believers, including me, unfortunately, I've done this and I am unlearning much from my past, that when I say God loves you unconditionally, yeah, but he's going to make you change, ha 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 ha, you know, um, which means you're not quite acceptable. Well, the more I remove the buts and the more I remove the, the excuses and the conditions, I'm finding greater peace that God is love and loves everyone and I don't have to understand it all. I think that's pretty cool. I also want you to see by the time we're done that you are God's beloved. Now act like you're loved. Live love, just like in the book The Shack. Uh, you know, we, we're called to live loved. I, I, my blog, I call it Live Loved. Um, or have that phrase on there because I think it's so important. If we don't know we're loved, we're not going to act like it. So today, Today's message is supposed to be like a spa day for your soul, reminding you over and over that you are loved, liked, and accepted. Seriously, this is my hope. And I think we can, I think if you hear with your heart uh, what these verses and uh, the intent of this message today, not necessarily my words, but what the Spirit would be saying to you, uh, I think you're going to find tremendous encouragement. It's like, you know, I've been in a massage before, and there are times it's like, what? It's over? Oh, just getting relaxed. So uh, you can't get enough of God's love. You can't hear it enough. And uh, I have a, uh, I picked a scripture verse uh, that I think is hilarious, um, but it is what it is. I'll sh- when I get to it, I'll, I'll smile with you and I'll, I'll point it out. But uh, you'll see what I mean when I get to it. Beloved in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we have lots of images of beloved. One of the most popular is Song of Solomon, uh, verses 2.16 and 6.13. And they basically say the same thing. I am my beloved, beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. So this is, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, but this, this is the essence of beloved. It's the free-flowing love of perhaps two lovers is one example. This is, this is a beautiful picture right in Scripture. We don't talk about that much in the church. We don't talk about Song of Solomon. That's the adult uh, book that we read. <laughs> Listen, that book is a amazing presentation of the free-flowing, reciprocal, mutual, self-giving, all-giving agape of God uh, and what it can look like in human relationships. Uh, again, a great image of it. That's all. Next, we've got Lamentations. Can you believe there's something really good in Lamentations about Beloved? Listen to this. If you're questioning God's love, this is going to be good news. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease. Kindnesses never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It's almost like a song. Huh. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Okay, I want to the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's a there's conflicting messages in the Christian world today. Um, listen, all believers that claim to be Christians um, are children of God, yes, but there are also people who don't know that God loves them that are children of God. In the church world, unfortunately, um, they, there seems to be a discrepancy that maybe God's love does stop. Uh, on this side of earth, you know, God's loving kindness never ends. But as soon as you die, and if you didn't make the right choice, you're toast. And his love ceases. Well, unfortunately, in the old covenant, 
and in the Old Testament. Here is wording that actually pulls out truth in a very real way. His loving kindness never ceases. His compassions never fail. Our compassions will fail with people. People are going to disappoint us, but God will not be disappointed by us. He has extended everlasting perfect love towards us. Now we need to receive it, believe it. Jeremiah 29 11. Um, again, this verse is one of our Hope Fellowship's prime verses of how this church came together. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Keep in mind, this verse was written to specific people. It still can be encouraging today. I don't think we can claim verses as our own. I think we can say, that verse really speaks to me. Wow, that was written so long ago, and now it speaks to another person? This is pretty cool. So that's where my lens is on, on this one. This is a great reminder that God is for us, not against us. Jeremiah 31.3 says, I have loved you with uh, an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued, continued my faithfulness to you. That's pretty rich that we are loved with an everlasting love. There's nothing we can do to make God love us less, stop loving us, or have him love us more. He already has his full-on love on us. The, there, it, the tap's on full. The, the fire hydrant has been cut right off, and it's spewing the love of God with an everlasting river of life. Isaiah 43, 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Um, wow, that, that's pretty cool that we are, we belong to somebody. And when we say that, when God can say that about us, um, it's like parenting. I love my kids, my son, Noah, my daughter, Avery, my son, Simon, my wife, Lori. When I say I love them, these are, this is my family. I am proud and nothing's going to change my love for them. This is what God's saying to you. Do you have a moment of despair? Do you ever feel alone? Do you ever have a sense that, I don't know, I think God feels really distant today. Well, that might be a feeling, but it's not true. So we need to get our minds right because our feelings flow from our emotions mostly. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. Like, this is... These are promises written to a prophet way, way back, thousands of years ago. Uh, and this was an image or perspective of how God viewed them. So we can learn from that today. Daniel 10, 11 says, And he said to me, Oh, Daniel, uh, oh, Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken his word to me, I stood up trembling. So, when we see somebody, um, and whatever the first comments are, hey, good to see you, haven't seen you for a long time, that's wonderful, you know, um, or if there's a look of disgust, oh, nuts, I don't want to see that person, <laughs> um, we, we have that, like, there are people in our lives like that, but God doesn't do that to us. Daniel needed to be reminded he was a man that was greatly loved. You are an individual that is greatly loved. Be reminded of that today. Daniel 10, 19. Oh man, greatly loved. Fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and I said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. That's my hope for this series, that you'll be strengthened by the truth of God's affirming love for you. You can't run from it. You can't hide. Zephaniah 317, this one's fun. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness, with his love. He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. There's another translation that says he'll uh, uh, dance over you. They'll rejoice over you. He'll dance. Like a dancing God? Seriously? I thought dancing was forbidden. <laughs> It's not. In fact, if you take a look at the Jewish culture, they dance like you wouldn't believe. Um, and not like our Western dancing. The, but the culture of dance was always there. The culture of, of celebrating. 
our our uh, our Western culture can be pretty stuffy. Uh, English and Canadian were even more conservative. Um, but when I went down to Mexico a number of times, and those who've traveled with me to Mexico and those who I know down there, uh, that culture is far more free. They're, they're more expressive in their colors. Their bright colored cars are multicolored cars. Their homes. When we painted uh, some, oh, well, we sent money to have some homes painted in a little village uh, with Gerardo. Um, multiple colors. We sent a bunch of colors down so that they could choose their color and paint what they wanted. They, they, they're spiced, they're excited, they're vibrant, they're expressive. And this is how God feels about you. God is very expressive to you. Depends on how you hear it. I don't know. You might be a personality that's really calm and, you know, you can hear bird chirp and that's God whispering his love to you because it's your way of hearing. Somebody else, they hear a, an amazing song or, you know, it's just got a wild beat and oh my goodness, and they, they just sense and feel the love of God. Somebody else is out in a kayak and they just, uh, like Rudy, my buddy, uh, I was talking to him yesterday, he was on a little, little lake uh, and just had a calm sense of peace just being out there. Um, Lori and I go out in kayaks every once in a while, we need to do more of it, but there's a sense of calm uh, when you're out there uh, where we can still hear the love of God. I think this next verse is the one I thought was pretty funny because you won't be able to read all the words because I'm, the font is too small and I wanted to put it in here. But this is going to be a great reminder. Psalm 136. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to God of gods. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to him who does mighty miracles. His faithful love endures forever. I'll stop there. Every line, his faithful love endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. I think this was a responsive song or poem that was written. And for those of us that complain about the repeating of choruses or songs or hymns that have multiple verses, <laughs> Psalm 136 on you. <laughs> oh my goodness. His faithful love endures forever. His faithful love endures forever. Try meditating on this one. How about go and read this psalm on your own in a quiet place, slowly. And don't read his faithful love endures forever quickly because I know what it's going to say. We do that. When we slow down and read each sentence with passion, with a hunger to extract a meaning from it, every single line, every phrase, even if it's repeated, and here it's repeated a ton of times, I think it's 26 times it's repeated. His faithful love endures how long? forever. I think that could mess up a lot of people's theology because some people think they can out sin God. I don't think you can. I think it's impossible. Uh, in our human world, yes, we got some terrible people that, let me rephrase that. We have people, blind people that have done terrible things, but they're still children of God, no matter what. They've done the harm from their darkness, from their blindness. So, yeah, anyway, really, really good song. Let's dig into some New Testament stuff because I think this is more and more good news. Oh, good. I'm going to actually finish what I hope to finish today and then continue next week with a one or two. Beloved in the New Testament. I love this next story. In Matthew 17, 5, uh, this is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Jesus goes up and Elijah and Moses come down and show themselves visibly in person. 3D, we're talking not a hologram. We're talking the real thing. Showed up and uh, the, some of the disciples were there and they saw this. And we're in absolute awe. And while... He was speaking, uh, Jesus was speaking, uh, I think, believe it was, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Oh, so it was Peter. Um, and behold, a voice of the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Another translation, the Passion Translation says, says it like this. But while Peter was still speaking, a radiant cloud uh, composed of light spread over them, enveloping them all. And God's voice suddenly spoke from the cloud saying, This is my dearly loved son. 
<laughs> Dearly loved son, the constant focus of my delight, listen to him. We got to read this slowly. We need to visit this image for a moment. And again, I'd like to remind you something about God's love. Here we have two representatives of the Hebrew faith that come down. Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the laws that were given, the written code, the right and wrong. And Elijah was one of the prophets who spoke of how we're to behave in the coming of the Messiah and, and blah, blah, blah. Trying to give a, a picture of who God is. Both of them had it wrong. Neither Moses nor Elijah nor any of the prophets. And by the way, nobody in the entire Old Testament ever God got God correct. None of them had a complete, perfect picture. Every one of them were flawed. So everything we have written in our Bibles, but you're trying to say the Bible is flawed? No, I'm saying the written accounts, the expressions that were described of who God is, there are flawed expressions that were written and kept. And we, if you think it's infallible, then you got a problem because that word will mess you up. I believe that... Uh, it is a great story pointing to Jesus. Jesus shows up later and says, hey, if, you, uh, if no one knows the Father but me. And so this is a great picture. So here we have God speaking. This is my beloved. This is my dearly loved son. My constant focus of my delight. And here he says, listen to him. He didn't say, okay, don't forget, guys, don't listen. Make sure you listen to Moses and don't forget what Elijah said and listen to my son too. He didn't say that. Listen to him. And what I looked up online is the idea of listen to him is ongoing. The listening to him is a keep on constantly listening to him. That's the intent of this verse. This is good news. Next, we come to Mark 1:11. Uh, this is when Jesus was baptized. There is a voice that spoke. In fact, twice where we hear God speak in the New Testament through Christ's ministry. I think it's only twice. And both times he says, uh, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Or in Passion Translation it says, you are my son, my cherished one, and my greatest delight is in you. Wow. Can we say that about our kids? I, I can they are my delight. Do we ever have difficulties in relationships? Of course we do. But they're still my delight. They're my joy. And this is how God sees us. Even when I humanly mess it up, God can't mess it up. He sees us with perfect delight and is well pleased. You cannot disappoint God. It's impossible. You'll never surprise him. You're never, never going to hear God go, oh, Shoot, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> no, he's pleased with you. He loves you. He's crazy about you. John 3, 16 and 17. This is a beautiful one. For this is how God loved some people who said the prayer. Oh, oops, let me reread that. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That verse is quite popular, but verse 17, I think these need to go together. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This, this is the justice of God. Do you know what the word justice means? Look it up, study it. You're going to have a bit of a jaw drop. It does not mean payback system. It does... <coughs> It does not mean a um, um, if somebody, you know, you, you crash in someone's car and you got to pay for the damage. That's not what justice is. Hebrew justice, or sorry, let me say uh, Roman justice that the Romans instituted, which is where we get our Western concept of justice, of play, level field, is more of a payback. Um, uh, but God's and Hebrew justice is put back, not payback but put back to its original state. We need to know our true identity to realize who we really are so that we experience the salvation of God. The salvation is Jesus revealing himself in us. Just like the Apostle Paul said, 
He was pleased that God revealed Christ in him, not to him. We don't have to reveal Christ to people. We can, we can stop that now. Instead, let's reveal Christ in them. The light of the world is in all. It's quite powerful. Get them to believe. Ask them to believe this amazing reconciliation. John 15, 9, another really powerful uh, verse. Just as the Father has loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. Passion Translation says it like this. I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. Wow. Okay, question is, do you believe God loves the Son? Yes. Do you believe God, the Son loves the Father? Yes. Do you believe God loves the Spirit? Yes. Do you believe the Spirit loves the Father? Yes. Do you believe that the Son, Jesus, loves the Spirit? Yes. Do you believe the Spirit loves the Son, Jesus? Yes. The Trinity, the triangle of pure love. Like, do you, What kind of love do you think that is? Do you think it's like conditional love? Do you think they got a beef with each other somehow? Do you think there's a running tally of, oh, I did that. I can't believe that. I can't believe you forgave that person. No, none of that happens in the Trinity. So Jesus just finished saying, just like God loves me, I love you. Folks, there's no excuse for the world not to know they're loved by God. Even those that do terrible things, I'll bet you, you start to swarm them, um, drown them in the love of God. They're going to begin to experience it one way or another. Let's not react. Let's let's be intentional in how we love others. Are you hearing this today? Are you hearing this solical uh, spa for your uh, the spa day for your soul? This is this is really good content. Romans one seven to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints or holy ones, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know we're called saints a whole bunch of times in the New Testament? You're not called a sinner. Not once in Scripture do we see um, anyone there called you are sinners. Jesus talked about that in his talks. But when we have Paul writing, he doesn't refer to any of the believers or the people he's writing to as sinners. When you identify someone as a sinner, you're dealing with a behavioral a core issue. Okay, I am a saint who sometimes sins. I don't believe everything about God that he has for me. Oh, I don't see him as I should, and I act out that, that blindness. But what we're reading here is we're called saints. Please see yourself as a saint. You may say, well, you don't know all that I've done and the bad habits I got. Your bad habits aren't who you are. They're just some things you do when you're not believing everything all the time. You're okay. You're a saint, holy, love, pure, forgiven. <laughs> Start believing that and watch the behavior change slowly in God's time. Romans 5, 6 to 8. For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love. Wow. For sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. Now, who of us would dare to die for the sake of a wicked person? We can all understand if someone was willing to die for a truly noble person. But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly this verse has got to be considered for all those who think there's an us versus them all right right here there is no us versus them there are people who believe and people who don't believe but we're still children of god this is a beautiful picture. While we were blind, while we couldn't impress, while we didn't have a resume to impress God, while we didn't have a successful heritage, God came and loved us and forgave us while we were still blind and helpless. That's a lot of love. Usually we don't reach out to people until we see their nice acts towards us or their kind generosity towards us. Then we respond back and, hey, I'll be your friend too. And you become friends, that kind of thing. This is God doing this to those who were trying to kill him. And he did this. He loved them. There's a lot of love here. All right. 
1 Corinthians 13, 13. Uh, well, actually, it's 4 down to 13. I want you to listen carefully. If you, if you want to know what love is, this is a perfect description of love from the Passion Translation. All right? This is God towards you. All right? This is God. When it says love, put God in there. Put Jesus in there. Jesus is large and incredibly patient. Jesus is gentle and consistently kind to all. Jesus refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. Like, you're starting to see the picture here? Love. Love is a big deal. Now, consider this towards you, of the love of God towards you. There's a lot of meat and potatoes in here. Unless you're a vegan, then sorry. Uh, there's a lot of asparagus in here for you. Love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements, nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seeks its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. In verse 13, until then, there are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. Yet love surpasses them all. So above all else... Let love be the beautiful prize for which you run. Huh. Is that good news or is that good news? I, I think it's great news. These are all ingredients for beloved. Like when we live beloved, <laughs> be loved. Um, our minds will slowly begin to change. Listen, if you've had years and years and years of I'm just a worm or I'm a no good sinner and you've, you've, you're just not good enough for God. Um, if you've had years and years and years of that, um, it's going to take a long time to hear that you're actually beloved and allow that truth to seep into you. There is no rush, but start taking it in. Start taking this incredible meal the recipe for your soul be still go off and pray don't be afraid find time to rest and believe you are loved so next week we're we're going to continue on beloved so i hope you'll join us back next week for that